I'm Ian Portalupi and welcome to the Northland Workshop. Today we're going to take a look at the most important tool I have in the workshop. This is the tool that I use more often than anything else and I use it for more things than anything else. And I would truly be lost without it and that is the radial arm saw. Now I bet a lot of you were expecting me to say the table saw and while that's the favorite tool of most woodworkers, I like the rail arm saw for its sheer versatility. What we're going to do today is go over how to use a rail arm saw because part of the issue with people with rail arm saws is just a lack of knowing how to use the thing. And if you don't use it properly, it can do a lot of damage in a hurry. So, what we're going to do is go through how to cross cut, do miters, rip with it, yes we're going to rip with it, how to do raised panels, and some taper cuts. And we're also going to use a dado head in it. So, if you want to know more about the real arm saw, this is the video for you. Before we use the real arm saw, we need to take a moment to talk about shop safety. You're going to notice there's a couple things missing off this rail arm saw. First of all are these leaf guards that mount to these screws right here. There's two of them, one for either side. I tried it with that once. They would hang up on the fence and cause all sorts of issues trying to get this thing to actually function. So I made two test cuts with these things installed about 10 years ago and they have been off this thing ever since. The other thing you're going to notice that's missing is the anti-kickback pawls that go on a rod that attaches right here and they're used for ripping so that way if it pinches the blade the workpiece doesn't come rocketing back out. The reason they're missing is simply they were missing when I got this saw. And I've looked on eBay, I've contacted a couple different companies that specialize in vintage woodworking machinery, and nobody seems to have the anti-kickback pawls for this rail arm saw. So I don't have them. If you have them, I highly suggest you leave them on. They do serve a purpose. Not for cross-cutting or mitering, but for ripping, they do serve a purpose. So, just be aware, if you see it like this, this is for demonstration purposes only. The most common cut you're going to make with the rail arm saw is a cross cut. So that's what we're going to look at first. The way the cross cut action works is the blade starts behind the fence and you would put the workpiece wherever it needs to be cut and line up the blade as it's going with the cut line. There's no fancy laser on this thing. You just kind of eyeball it and the easiest way to do is to sight right down the blade and as it rotates you'll see the teeth that stick out farthest and line it up with the mark and cut it. Easy enough. But there are a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, the blade cuts that way. It spins like it's trying to drive itself through the wood. And this freaks a lot of people out. And it does take a little getting used to because the thing does want to feed itself through the wood, which means it wants to propel itself along towards you. So first thing, if you have the workpiece over here and you're using your right hand to guide the saw and your left hand to push down on the workpiece and towards the fence, make sure you don't get your left thumb in the line of the cut because it's not going to care if your thumb's there. So make sure that you are away from the blade path. As long as you're away from the blade path, no matter what happens, the thing can't get you. So you want to make sure that your hand isn't anywhere near where the cut's going to be made. The other thing is, if for some reason 
you have to make the cut on the other side, you don't want to cross over the line of the cut with your hand. In this case, you would want to use your right hand to hold the workpiece and use your left hand to pull the saw through the cut. So that way you never cross that cut line. Because again, if something goes wrong and the saw jumps forward, anything in that line is going to get cut. Sometimes you see people say that you should pull the saw all the way out, slide the workpiece over, and then cut back through it. So that way it's not trying to propel itself through the cut. Well, that makes some sense in that it's not trying to climb its way through the cut and feed itself. The issue is there's a very good reason they have it the other way around. With the blade rotating this way, as it cuts, it's trying to push down on the workpiece and back towards the fence. That way, the workpiece stays on the table. That's not to say you don't need to hold it there, you should still hold it there, but it's also trying to push down on the workpiece and up against the fence the entire way along. Which is good, that's what you want. If you pull the saw out, first of all, you're going to have this blade sitting here spinning and you're trying to scoot a workpiece behind it. That's a recipe for disaster. And the other issue you have is as soon as you start cutting, what this thing's going to want to do is pick up on the workpiece and throw it back like that. And it'll do that if you want it to. That's not a good idea because then you have a flying piece of wood on your hands. The rail arm saw was never made to work like that. What you do is you accept the fact that sometimes it wants to climb cut and feed itself. So the key is to have a firm grip on the handle. Don't just pull it with one finger because it'll decide it wants to propel itself along and launch at you. Firm grip and be prepared to resist the thing coming out. The thing's going to want to move along on its own and you have to kind of keep it at bay. It takes a little getting used to, but once you're used to it, it's really not that bad. If you have a saw with an upper arm that is really wimpy and it can deflect quite a bit, that'll make the climbing action worse because the motor itself will try to lift up just a little bit, get up on the wood some more, and really take off. So the cheaper the saw, the more it wants to do that. This big heavy thing, it really just behaves nicely. Let's make a cross cut and see how this thing works. As you can see, it makes a really nice splinter free cut at the top because the teeth are cutting down into the material. And if we look at the bottom, it's got a little bit of tear out, but not bad. And I could fix that by filling in this kerf that it cuts in the table. The best way to fill it in is to actually use Bondo, fill in all the curves once they get too bad, and then sand it down. Or what I do when it gets bad enough is just replace the plywood table with a new table. One thing we should talk about is blade selection. Now you're going to hear a lot of people say you should use a negative hook blade, which means instead of the teeth being curved in the direction of the cut, they're actually sloped away from the cut. 
and that'll help it not try to feed itself as you pull it through. The issue with that is that I can't find a negative hook combination blade, which is what this is. You've got the big gullets and the small gullets, and it's designed for both cross-cutting and ripping. And because I do both cross-cutting and ripping with this saw, I need a blade that can do both. I have never found the positive hook blades that I use on this one or three other rail arm saws that I've used in the past. They all had positive hook blades. I never had an issue with any one of them. So if you want the negative hook blade and all you're going to do is cross cut with the thing, go for the negative hook blade. Otherwise, I'm here to tell you I've never found an issue with the positive hook ones. The whole order of cross-cutting with a radial arm saw is confusing to a lot of people because it's the exact opposite way of doing it with a sliding compound miter saw. And because sliding compound miter saws are more popular nowadays, that's what everybody thinks of. With a sliding compound miter saw, the way you make the cross-cut is to pull the head out pass the workpiece, start the saw, plunge it down, and then push it back through. Why does it work for the sliding compound miter saw and not the radial arm saw? Well, for one thing, this doesn't just have an on-off switch, so the blade doesn't start until you're ready. With the radial arm saw, you turn the saw on, and it's sitting there spinning the whole time. So this, you're not trying to position the wood behind the spinning blade. The other reason is this has a hinged head. So, like I said before with the real arm saw, if the saw's arm has a lot of deflection to it, it can try to ride up over the workpiece and help propel itself along. Well, this is really going to do that because it's spring-loaded. It's already trying to push itself up. So if you were to plunge down at the start and then pull this way, you're just asking for it to kick up and out. You're probably wondering, okay, if you can plunge down in and push the saw back through the workpiece here, how come it doesn't pick up on the workpiece like I said the rail arm saw would? Well, it does. And if you use a sliding compound miter saw long enough, sooner or later you're going to have it grab a piece of wood and try to lift it on you. So you have to hold it down firmly. The other thing is, is that they have hold downs that go on the back of the fence that clamp this thing firmly down to the table to prevent it from doing that. And if you read the manual, it says you're always supposed to use those things when using a sliding compound miter saw as a sliding compound miter saw. If you have the head locked in chop mode, that's not an issue because it's not causing the blade to come up through the workpiece and trying to lift it up. However, nobody ever uses those hold downs. But that is still an issue and it does happen on occasion. So just for good measure, let's try making a cross cut with the radial arm saw's distant cousin, the sliding compound miter saw. Now on that one, you'll see that the top edge gets the chip out and the bottom edge is fine because the blade is cutting up from the bottom. We've explored how to properly cross cut on a rail arm saw and its distant cousin, the sliding compound miter saw. Now let's set it up for a miter cut. First thing we need to do is pull the blade out past the fence and now crank the blade up because otherwise it's going to be trapped in this curve and we could bend the blade when we try to rotate this thing plus it's just not going to rotate if it's trapped in the table. 
Now, on this radial arm saw, the height adjustment crank is in the front right below the table. On a lot of the DeWalt's, the crank is located right at the top of the column. It doesn't really matter where it is, you just have to locate where it is on your particular saw. This is the double arm style saw. So you have the arm that the motor carriage actually rides on, and then it's got this shorter support arm on the top. In this case, this does the angles for the miter. If you have a single arm saw, the clamping mechanism is going to be back on the column. It just, whatever saw you have, that's the way you got to deal with it. In this case, I release the clamp lever and I have this little knob on the front that I pull out. That's the detent stop for 90 and 45 in either direction. So I pull that out and now I can rotate it to whatever angle I want to set it at. Originally, this thing had a metal scale right here with all the degrees marked out in it. And being that this came from a high school shop, somebody pried that off years before I got it. So now I just use Protractor to set it, or if I'm going 45 degrees either way, I let the spring-loaded detent do it. And if we rotate it right there, we hear it click into place, and then I can lock it in. If I don't want it to be 45 degrees, I don't have to have it be 45 degrees. It can be whatever angle I want. So let's just set it whatever angle that ends up being. That'll be good for demonstration purposes. So I lock it in place. Now I have an issue. I need to cut a curve in the table because the bottom of the blade needs to be in the table slightly so it cuts all the way through the piece of wood. I can't just crank this thing down and then turn it on because if the blade is pressed down into the table, the motor, when it starts up, is just going to act like a wheel and propel this thing forward. And that's dangerous. So what I want to do is take the carriage lock, which is this knob right here on this saw. Every rail arm saw has a carriage lock. You just got to locate yours. Lock that in place. So now the motor can't slide side to side. What I can do is turn the motor on and slowly lower the blade down so it's just below the surface of the table. Again, you want to make sure it's locked in place so it can't go anywhere. So if I turn it on... So once I had it down so it was just below the surface of the table, I unlocked the clamp with my hand on the handle and I was able to pull it out and push it back through the fence to complete the kerf. At this point we have a slight issue. And the slight issue is, is that this blade sticks out past the front of the fence. If I was cutting a thinner piece of wood that wouldn't be a problem, but it's just not a good idea to have a big chunk of the blade out in front of the fence when you're trying to move stuff around. Thankfully, this table has a whole bunch of sections to it. So what I need to do for safety is to move this fence forward some. And in order to do that, I will unclamp the table. This one has the little locking knobs right on the front of the table. Other ones, the clamps are in the back. And what I can do is take out this piece of plywood, scoop
scoop the fence forward and then reinstall this piece of plywood in behind it. Now when I push the motor back, I can get the blade all the way past the fence so that way I can move the wood around here without worrying about part of the blade hanging out. Now I will have to recut the kerf in this little section right here, but that's not a big problem because it'll do that the very first time I go to cut a piece of wood. Speaking of which, let's cut a miter. So cutting the miter is going to be just like the cross cut. I'll put the mark where I want the miter to start and I'll line it up with the blade just like before. Let's make a bevel cut. So at this point, I need to crank this saw way up. Now I'm going to use these two controls right here. I've got this little clamp, which I can unclamp. That loosens up the swivel on the yoke. And now I can pull out the 90 degree detent knob and I can rotate the blade to whatever angle I want. I can even rotate it in the other direction up to about 15 degrees, but don't really need to do that very often. So, and again, it's going to detent at 30 degrees and one at 45 degrees, and you can set it wherever you want. Let's bevel something at 45 degrees. So the lever locked into place, lock down the clamp mechanism. One thing you want to be careful of, if you adjust the clamp mechanism on some of the cheaper radial arm saws, this whole clamp assembly might be cast aluminum. And it's very common to see these things broken because somebody cranked this down too hard. So just be aware if it ends up being made out of cast aluminum, you just don't want to go nuts cranking it down because you can break that clamp yoke. At this point, just like before, we would have to turn on the saw blade, lock the carriage in place, lower it down slightly, and then move it back and forth. In this case, I don't have to because I've already beveled things at 45 degrees before, so I can put it right back into that curve. So if I just crank it down slowly, right to there. That hits ever so slightly, so I'll back it up half a turn. Perfect. Because I have the saw set back to 90 degrees, I could move this fence back to its other location, but I'm not cutting anything super wide, so we'll just leave it there for right now. Let's bevel something. We've done cross-cutting, we've done mitering, we've done beveling. Now it's time to rip with the radial arm saw. And yes, we can rip with it safely if we follow a couple guidelines. First of all, the blade rotation matters. And up until now, we've essentially been climb cutting because the blade has been rotating in the same direction we're feeding it. That is not the case for ripping at all. 
you never want to feed the wood in with the direction of the blade because if you do it's going to grab the thing feed itself and launch it across the shop possibly through a wall or a person and that'll wreck your day in a hurry so the radial arm saw manufacturers always mark on the guard which side not to rip from and this is where it gets a little complicated because with a table saw you always know which side of the table saw to feed the wood into the rail arm saw varies and what I mean by that is there's a detent lock right over here and there's this lever right here for the swivel of the carriage not the swivel for the arm but the motor carriage itself I unlock that and I lift up on the detent and I can rotate the saw carriage 90 degrees one way or the other and then it locks into place then don't forget to lock in the actual clamp so that way it doesn't move this is called out ripping because the blade is away from the column so if I was to take the fence on the table and move it all the way to the back and I move this thing all the way out I would get about 32 and a half inches of rip capacity on this thing. Because the blade spins this way, I need to feed the wood opposing the direction of rotation, just like on a table saw. Think of this as an upside down table saw. Never this way. In fact, you will see it says caution, never rip from this end. That's your hint. Don't feed the wood in this way. Okay. Well, we can also do something called in ripping, which is where it rotates 180 degrees away, and now the motor hangs out this way, and we can get much closer to the column. At this point, I have to feed the wood from this side because the blade is rotating this way. So, depending on which way you rotate the motor, you have to change which end you feed the wood from. And that can be confusing, and if you get it wrong, it goes bad in a hurry. So just be aware of that. It takes a little more thought than a table saw. So, for the sake of the demonstration, I don't have anything super, super big to rip, so we will do the in-ripping, and I'm going to leave the fence right where it is, because it gets it just a little bit closer to the camera. It doesn't really matter where the fence is as long as the distance from the fence to the blade is the distance it needs to be to get the size workpiece you need. You'll notice in this table it's got a little trough right here that happens to be the same arc as the diameter of the blade. That is because what I did is I lowered it down and I slid it side to side so that way I could position this thing anywhere I wanted to on this thing and lock it in place. This is also where the carriage lock comes in handy. This is your lock mechanism so when you set the distance from the blade to the fence it stays at that distance. If I turn the radial arm saw around one more time so you can take a look at it, there's one more thing we have to deal with. And that is this blade guard. The guard has a slot in the back and a little wing nut that I loosen up and I can tip the guard. The reason for that is this blade is rotating and as it rotates it's trying to actually pick the workpiece up off the table. Well, that's less than ideal. If I lower this thing down so it's in its little groove. There it is. Imagine the workpiece coming along. We'll use this scrap as an example. It's coming along and the blade's coming up, 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 up. If it was to grab it, it's going to try and lift it up off the table. We don't want that to happen. This front edge of the guard is actually designed to work as 
a type of hold down for the thing. So what we would do is rotate the guard and lock it into place just as close to the top surface of that workpiece as possible. So that way, if it does lift up, it's really not going very far. Even this distance right here, this is about a half inch away, is a little more than I like, but it's as close as that guard gets, so I just have to deal with it. But it keeps it contained, so if it gets really interesting, it doesn't come up and smack me in the face. Again, you want to make sure you are going against the rotation of the blade because you don't want it to suck it in and just feed it along. Because if it sucks it in and feeds it along, it could very well suck your hand into it. Now, this looks kind of scary back here because you have this great big open area with the blade. Well, you're not on that side of the blade. You should not be on that side. You should be on this side. You've got a solid cover in your way. Don't touch that side. So, if we set it up to rip, I said we were going to do in ripping, but I think for the sake of viewing, the out ripping would probably be better. And I'm not real particular about what width it is, so it's going to be roughly there. Normally, there's not a whole lot of dust that comes out this port, except when we're ripping. That's when this port really shines because the blade is picking up the wood dust, flinging it into this guard, and it comes rocketing out of there. So I moved this hose out of the way for photographic clarity earlier. I'm just going to stick that back on because otherwise it's just going to be raining dust everywhere. And just like a table saw, when you have a narrow piece of wood between the blade and the fence, you want to use a push stick for it. I survived ripping with all my fingers intact, so now it's time to do some specialty cuts. Let's say I need to cut this taper on this random scrap piece for some reason. If it was a long slender taper, I could do it over at the table saw with the tapering jig, but this short little taper is going to be kind of hard on the table saw. Not to say I can't do it, but I don't want to do it. So this is one of the nice things about a real arm saw is that the table's made out of wood. You can screw down other pieces of wood to make the jig part of the table. In this case, what I want to do is figure out where the blade's going to line up with that cut line. The next thing I want to do is I extended the line down the edge of the workpiece and I'm going to line it up with the kerf in the table. Right about like that. What I can do now is take this random piece of wood that I keep around for just such occasions and screw it down to the table. Now what I can do is hold the workpiece up against the fence and tight against this little auxiliary fence and I can make as many of those tapers as I want. Let's try it out. I've unplugged the saw and now we can go ahead and put the dado head on. So for this, I'm going to loosen up the wing nut that holds the upper guard on and remove the guard entirely. That makes it a little bit easier for blade changes. 
If I take a scrap piece of wood and put it right about there, I now have the very big wrench with the very big arbor nut. The way to determine which way to turn an arbor nut is just turn the wrench in the direction the blade rotates. So in this case it rotates this way, so I rotate the wrench this way. comes off. This is the dado head that I have for the ray alarm saw. This ray alarm saw is a 14 inch diameter ray alarm saw so it has a 1 inch diameter arbor hole which means the 8 inch dado head that my table saw takes can't fit on it. So I had to get this one special. Just like a standard dado head it has the two outer blades and a whole series of chippers to make up whatever thickness dado I want. So all I do is start stacking it up and I get the width I want. One thing to be careful of though is to make sure the teeth go in the right direction. Next comes the chippers. I want to make sure that the carbide teeth of the chippers go in between the teeth on the outer blade so that way I don't accidentally chip them. Now the outer blade, again making sure carbide teeth don't hit each other. The washer and the arbor nut go back on. Now I can go ahead and put the upper guard back on. Now setting the height for the dado head on a ray alarm saw isn't quite as easy as a table saw because it's hard to get the tape measure in there and measure it. So what I like to do is lay out where the height needs to be on a piece of wood and simply lower it down until the teeth get to it. Right about there. That should be good. Now you can see it hits the fence because that opening isn't big enough. So just like before, we're going to turn it on and cut our way through. One thing to keep in mind is because the dado head is removing more material at a time, it's going to have even more force trying to push the head along. So you've got to be ready to resist it feeding itself. So just be aware it likes to do that. And of course you can use the dado head in the ripping position as well. Now I don't know how well the camera angle picked up 
what I was doing with my right hand. So I'm going to reenact it so that way you can see what I was doing. Because this is kind of important. What you don't want to do is put your hand down on the outfeed side of that. Because if it was to kick back, it's dragging your hand right into that blade. So what I was doing, I was keeping it pushed to the fence way out here. So if the board had decided to go, my hand isn't directly in line with that blade. You never want to get your hand in line with the blade because if the wood decides to take off on you, it's going to pull you right into the blade. Out here, if it had decided to kick back, I might have bruised up my fingers a little bit because it would have been rough with the wood whizzing by, but I wouldn't have gotten sucked into the blade. So just be aware that you never want to grab the workpiece like this and try and pull it through because if it decides to go back, it's taking your hand with it. Now that we have defied death with not only dado heads, but dado heads in the ripping position on this thing, there's really only one other interesting thing that I do with this radial arm saw on a regular basis, and that is to make raised panels. Because on the table saw, trying to push a raised panel through with a panel raising jig that goes on the fence is just tippy. It can be done, but I don't like it. There's a better way, and this is the better way. So the first thing we have to do is crank this thing way, way up. And the reason for this is we need to swing the motor down past horizontal. What I'm going to do, loosen it up, start rotating it, and then it locks into place when it's perfectly parallel with the table. We'll leave it like that for the time being because there's a couple more things we need to do to it. First, I need to unlock the carriage and rotate it this way. So now the blade is facing out. The issue is, somehow, we've got to be able to get this thing to raise a panel. So if I unlock the fence to the table, and I take that right out of here, I've actually built a special table for just such occasions. So here is the panel raising table. It's just a table that sits on top of the regular table and it has a piece of three-quarter inch plywood that drops down in the same slot that the original fence goes in. So if I line it up, right about there, right about here, locks down in, we have the same clamps that clamp the table together. Now you can start to see how this thing works. The blade sticks through the slot in the fence, and that adjusts how wide the raised part of the raised panel is. But we have one issue. Right now, it's parallel to the table. So if I want to cut grooves for tongue and groove boards, this would be a great way to do it, but it's not going to raise any panels. To set the angle of the blade, I have a whole series of these wedges. I've got a 10 degree one, 15 degree one, and a 12 degree one, and depending on what angle I want the bevel on the raised panel to be, I just choose the appropriate wedge. At this point, what I do is unlock the bevel adjustment again, and I can start to swing the blade to whatever angle I want it to be set at. And with a little bit of fine tuning, I can get the blade to 
whatever angle I want it to be at. Then I just have to set the height and the distance away and I'm ready to raise panels. Now I don't have any scrap wood that I need to turn into raised panels right now. So please enjoy this clip of me raising panels on the little nightstand I built a year ago. I hope this video has helped demystify what I consider the most important tool in my workshop, the rail arm saw. So, until next time, I'm Ian Portalupi for the Northland Workshop.